I thank you again uh, for your word and for the opportunity to be gathered here today to worship you. We ask that your spirit would speak to us now as we yeah, look at this uh, first part of Matthew's gospel uh, where Jesus came into the world. Lord, we pray that uh, not only would you help us to understand what's happening here, but you would guide us and show us what it means to be one of your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the book Great Expectations is one of Charles Dickens' best known novels. Uh, I'm not sure if many of you would have read this or not, but it follows the life of Pip, a young orphan who grows up aspiring to be a wealthy gentleman and win the heart of the beautiful lady Estella. It's a stormy tale of poverty, prison, uh, prison ships, fights to the death. It's filled with hope, excitement, and our natural fear of disappointment when we have great expectations. Now, all of us come into the world with expectations, don't we? Uh, when Kerry and I were first uh, becoming parents, uh, every family like us, I would say in our generation, if you like, we were given the famous pregnancy book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. Turned out it was a book mostly for mums and not dads, uh, and maybe gave a little bit too much detail for what you really needed uh, to know. Uh, but no one's yet written the book, what your baby expects when you're expecting. But generally, we all have the most human of expectations, don't we? We each come into this world looking for somebody else to love us and looking for us. You know, I did, you did. And as we grow up, we cultivate expectations, hopes and dreams of what our lives might be like. I expect to be cared for. I just expect to always come first, perhaps. I expect I will parent my children much better than my parents parented me. And then as reality bites, <laughs> we often have to then learn to be an adult. We eventually recognise the power of our expectations when they aren't being met, perhaps, especially when we fail to meet our own expectations, live up to our own standards. From there, much of the pain in our lives stems from the disappointment of unmet expectations, not just of ourselves, but especially of others. And the greater the expectations, the greater can be the disappointment. Yet as humans, we still dare to dream, don't we? Have you noticed that? We don't stop imagining hoping or expecting. Well, last week, Matthew's gospel, sorry, two weeks ago, Rod was last week, uh, two weeks ago, we opened Matthew's gospel with an avalanche of dangerous promises that came through the genealogy. Uh, these promises were bringing with them the great expectation of the whole of the Old Testament, of how God might fulfill these apparently long past promises made to Abraham and to David. We heard some of the promises this morning that God made to David. Remember how the genealogy started and finished. This is the genealogy, the Genesis, of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it finished with, thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, who are these two key stakeholders in the promises, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Matthew opens his gospel with an abbreviation, if you like, of the whole Bible, the whole of the Old Testament. He's captured our interest uh, with the dangerous origins of Jesus, the Messiah, where he comes from, his genesis. And with the mention of Abraham 
our hopes are kindled with the promise of land, offspring and blessing, a place to call home. We remember that old couple, Abraham and Sarah, and how it was going to be almost impossible for them to even have one child. But there they were expecting the birth of a son, which means today we should expect some more impossibilities when we hear of another couple expecting a son. Matthew also sets off our senses, doesn't he, uh, mentioning David, you know, King David there in the middle of the genealogy, the one whom God enlarged his promises to, not only now of land and offspring and blessing, but for a son who would build God's house, a proper home, a son of David who'd build God's kingdom a son who'd be God's forever king. Now we remember how Solomon, uh, David's, uh, you know, the next in line after David on the throne, he starts so well, but he slips badly, doesn't he? He swaps out his well ex- well-placed expectations, if you like, for God's satisfaction, contentment, delight, for a bunch of twisted expectations, greed, power, and lust. And he destines the next 13 generations of David's sons for God's judgment, driving them into exile. But Matthew says, in the silence of exile, God was still at work, bringing this story of history to a crescendo, if you like, 14 generations from the exile to the place of trying to live out in the wilderness while really dying, to the Messiah, from darkness to light. With God's Messiah, we are seeing he's coming out of exile himself and bringing his people with him. So Matthew's dangerous gospel begins with a promise, a dangerous one. This Messiah will change how you want to run your life. He's going to show you how to come out of exile to darkness and into the light. And so what we should be expecting are dangerous expectations. That's where Matthew's going to lead us. Uh, Dangerous expectations followed by faithful fear and lastly, fearful fulfilment. Verse 18 again. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Jesus the Messiah is arriving amidst the whiff of scandal. Something's not quite right here. At first it sounds Like the classic story of boys' parents meet girls' parents. A dowry is offered. Maybe they've swapped a sandal or something to, to, you know, make the deal. A guarantee of marriage given and received. The Virgin Mary is engaged to marry Joseph, son of a man called Jacob, as we read in the genealogy. It's all good. Great expectations await. It's a match made in heaven, except Mary's pregnant. There's a baby bump. This is more than a little awkward, isn't it? See, this is a scandal. See, for the Jews to be engaged was legally binding. A pledge to marry was a solemn promise. Broken only by death or divorce and only consummated on the wedding night, sometimes years after, when the bride would leave her parents' home, coming together with her husband in his home. Pledged but not yet married, Joseph discovers Mary is pregnant. Now, this is not what he was expecting. 
Sure, Matthew tells us, you know, it's by the Holy Spirit. It's our privilege to know. But Joseph, well, he has no idea at this point. So without any copies of what to expect when you didn't expect to be expecting, Joseph is faced with some difficult decisions as we come to verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. According to Moses, Mary's apparent unfaithfulness would lead any self-respecting man to expect to divorce her, to break off the engagement, to end this apparent facade of marital faithfulness, not be treated like a fool, taken for a fool. And for Mary, this is quite literally a matter of life and death. A public divorce leads to a life lived in shame. There's a chance here, if living by the law of Moses, you could be stoned to death for this. At least she can now expect to live a life of disgrace within her community as an adulteress. But Matthew is a master craftsman fitting in the detail just in the right place. So he, he actually shows us here the stuff that Joseph is made of. Joseph, he says, is faithful to the law. And it's another way of saying it, he's a righteous man. The man who loves the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. Instructions for how to live life together. This is what God expects of his people. A man who is learning to be loved by God and now in turn loves like his God. Joseph's, ca Joseph's character is on display here for us today. And like all of us, the man's true character is most revealed when he's put under pressure. As a righteous man, it's, it's appropriate that he divorced Mary. He's free to, entitled to, and everyone would expect him to. But he's also a compassionate man, gentle, unselfish, choosing to divorce her quietly because like his God, he chooses to be faithful even to an apparently unfaithful person. By divorcing her quietly, he's choosing to save her from a life of shame. In Luke's gospel, you hear a lot of beautiful words from Mary. But in Matthew's telling, it's Joseph's strong actions that he wants you to notice. This most quiet, reserved, thoughtful character in all of the Bible, in some ways, has the heaviest of expectations placed on his shoulders. Matthew's already, in a sense, given us uh, a foretaste of what's going to happen here. Uh, back in verse 16, it says, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So Matthew's already set this up for us. And although he doesn't yet know it, Joseph, this unassuming carpenter from Nazareth, is designed to be or well, he's destined to be the earthly father of God's divine son, the long-expected son of David, the son of God, even we're expecting somehow to bring blessing to the whole world, as was promised to Abraham. Joseph is Jesus' father the earthly dad chosen to raise the Messiah. There's no pressure. I mean, someone's got to do it, right? How would you handle the weight of such expectation? You see, it's indeed a fearful thing for the living God to be at work 
in your life, especially when he has such great expectations on you to raise his child in the world, especially when he's at work fulfilling his promises to you through his Messiah. Fear and fulfilment seem to come together at this point when he's around. It's no wonder then that what we should expect for Joseph is fear of some sort. And that's what we see here, a faithful fear. Look at verse 20. After he'd considered this, after he'd considered divorcing Mary, his betrothed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew moves us along as, you know, Mary's baby bump begins to grow bigger. Joseph's adjusted expectations now in his head, making decisions initially to divorce, but to do so quietly. But then, like Joseph's Old Testament namesake, Joseph in the Old Testament has this dream of a stairway to heaven. Now, this Joseph's having a dream. But the angel is testing his heart. The angel now reveals to Joseph what we know is the inside story. We already know this. Mary's mysterious pregnancy is of God. This is God's doing. The Holy Spirit. Just like in Genesis, when God's Holy Spirit hovered over the waters to create everything from nothing. So here with the genesis of Jesus, God's spirit is poised over Mary's womb to bring the creator himself into his own creation. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. A couple of things to notice here. You notice he says, Joseph, son of David. Well, wait a minute. This guy's dad is Jacob, isn't it? In the genealogy. It always pays to pay attention to people's names in the Bible because they mean something. It's hardly a typo. Once again, Matthew crafts a verse that's saturated with connection here. This is to remind everybody reading this that Joseph comes in the line of King David. He's royalty. He's in the line of kings, the kings of Israel. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, is to be named by you, Joseph, the Son of David. This is written so that the Jewish people might understand. The ancient Hebrew, Hebrew right of the father to name his son, Jesus is the Son of God, conceived of the Spirit, yes, but he's also the Son of David legally named by Joseph, the son of David, of the royal line, the house of David. There's so much in a name and even more so in this name of Jesus. Yeshua, as it's originally pronounced, means the Lord saves. The Messiah's name tells its own story of a future fulfilment, its destiny, uh, like a kind of a job description. So the angel tells Joseph to name this son Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. Now, a Jewish person hearing these words would be transported back deep into their history. 
You'd feel like you've just been tackled in the state of origin if you heard this. Israel's sins had taken them from the glory days of David's kingdom into the dark days of the exile. It's a crunching reminder of God's judgment on their sins. Because to be saved from their sins doesn't mean they'll be kept from sin, but that they'll be saved from the consequences of them. And here, packed into a couple of seemingly simple sentences, Joseph hears the news that his people have been expecting for so long the hope of God's promise to Adam, Abraham, David. This hope is now being reborn with the birth of Jesus. Imagine the weight of expectation now on Joseph's shoulders. Matthew's brought in all the big guns, if you like. He's taken us back to the creation, the fall, all the way to the exile. There's so much to take in. I imagine Joseph's head would be spinning a bit at this point. <laughs> Heart racing, hands shaking. No wonder he's afraid to take Mary home as his wife. This is not what he was expecting. But even the angel said to him, do not be afraid. But we know Joseph is faithful in his fear, even with the dangerous expectations that he needs to face up to here. As Matthew leads us into the final part of our reading today, he sets up a pattern that he's going to repeat over and over and over throughout his gospel. He now looks and speaks directly to you, the reader. He gives information specifically for the one reading the gospel. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. It's as though Matthew's asking if you're listening at this point. Matthew wants to see that you see what he's telling you. He wants to make sure that you're noticing. For someone hearing this gospel for the first time, this is new information. But for the whole Jewish nation, it's a reminder. This break in the story transports us back to a couple of hundred years before the exile. He's quoting Isaiah the prophet's warning of God's righteous judgment and the expectation of salvation that will follow as God holds out his hand to his people. Matthew loves his Old Testament, and all through this seven-part series, we'll see him enrich his gospel with Old Testament wisdom. It's kind of like the fulfillment formula. He's going to reach back, grab parts of the Old Testament, and bring them before us to show how God is fulfilling what he's told his people all along. And this promise, well, it's, it's massive, isn't it? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Another dangerous expectation that the angel conveys to Joseph. Remember, at this point, we're still mid-dream, if you like, with the angel appearing, speaking and commanding Joseph about the reality of Mary's pregnancy. No one else at this stage is expecting this. But helpfully, Matthew translates it for us. Emmanuel means God with us. God's promise to be present once again with his people, the greatest of expectations that somehow he'd make a way for us to be God's people in God's place under God's rule. This declaration shouts out that the exile of God's people 
is now over. But it means that our exile can be over too. My exile can come to an end. The fulfilment of Isaiah's prophecy will be heard in this newborn baby's cry. And with that, we're back in the room with Joseph. The sweet dream, the first of many dreams of this dreamer, ends. The hot rush of Joseph's adrenaline, we can imagine, now fades into fear and the cold reality dawns on him. What will he do? Well, when Joseph woke up, verse 24, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he didn't consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Joseph is obedient regardless of what everyone else is going to think. He takes Mary into his home as his wife, honouring their marriage vows and Mary's divine pregnancy. Despite the dangerous disgrace, this now risks for both of them. We do realise at this point, don't we, that by Joseph keeping Mary, he's joining her in her shameful position, just like the angel promises that his son will join us in ours. He names his newborn son Jesus, this son of David, son of God, Jesus, the Messiah, Emmanuel, is the God who's in it to win it for all of us. He's going to save us. Jesus, the main character of Matthew's gospel, has finally arrived in a flood of dangerous expectation. But today, today is all about Joseph. Joseph is a righteous man, a man of honour and courage, still taking Mary to be his wife. And in so doing, taking upon himself her apparent guilt. His righteousness here shines like the sun. I mean, who's going to believe their story? What do you mean the Holy Spirit did it? Yeah, sure, mate. Whatever you reckon. Well, as we come to the end of Matthew chapter 1, I'm feeling perhaps like you are that there's been a lot to take in at this point. Imagine how Joseph is coping right now. The truth is Joseph is the first person we meet in the New Testament here in Matthew's Gospel. And so to Matthew's first readers, he was someone they can identify with. His expectations were theirs, their expectations, his fears were their fears. Joseph's predicament was parallel to theirs. Like them, Joseph is now faced with a life-defining decision. Either continue in the deeply ingrained ways of Jewish tradition or follow a new wonderful dream from God that only comes at enormous personal cost. Joseph chooses wisely and obediently rather than safety and convenience in the law. Joseph, the namesake of a dreamer, clearly follows the dream. Though his life is made vastly more difficult as a result, around every corner he is going to be protected by God. But Joseph's not going to be the last person we meet in the New Testament. As Matthew's later readers, he speaks to us today. Joseph is someone we can identify with, but just in a different culture from an earlier time with a much heavier weight of expectation. See, we're not the son of David being called to name the son of God. But this call of his son, the Messiah, 
the baby Joseph himself names here today is still the same. The Lord's call on us is the same, to either continue in the deeply ingrained habits of our striving to live here on earth in a place of death or to follow a new and wonderful dream of God, to want something different, but it will come at enormous personal cost. Jesus in the rest of Matthew's Gospel will show us more of what we fear in this and how he offers to fulfil it in us. Jesus offers dangerous expectations to us. When it comes to Jesus the Messiah, the son of Joseph, what else could you expect? Let's pray. Dear Lord, our Father in heaven, we want to thank you that with the coming of Jesus, there is a great expectation set up for even us today that our sins might be forgiven because that's what his name means, that he will save his people from their sins. Lord, with all of these expectations now on baby Jesus, we pray that you would help us to follow along in this gospel to see the full extent of your promises to us, that we may also be saved and granted a place with you in your kingdom forevermore. Lord, enrich us today. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.